Resurrection this Easter Sunday to the worship service of First Presbyterian Church of Sterling and Myersville Presbyterian Church, both in Long Hill Township, New Jersey. I am so glad that you decided to join us on this special day, this, this empty cross day, this joyful day. Let us worship God. I invite you to join me in the call to worship by responding with the words on the screen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. In his resurrection, the heaven and the earth rejoice. Alleluia. The gates of hell are broken and the power of sin and death are destroyed. The dead are raised and we are brought from death to life. Christ confounded the guards and executioners and filled the disciples with joy. We no longer look for Jesus among the dead, for the tomb is empty and he has become the Lord of life. Let us pray. We praise you and thank you, O God, that your glory has dawned on us and brought us to this day of resurrection. We rejoice that the grave could not hold your son and that he has conquered death and risen to rule over all powers of this earth. We praise you that he summons us into new life to follow him with joy and gladness. By your spirit, lift us from doubt and despair and set our feet 
on Christ's holy way, that our lives may be signs of his life, and that all we are and have may show forth his love. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power and the glory forever. Amen. From Psalm 118. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel stay, say, his steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely, but he did not give me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 10, verses 34 through 43. Peter is preaching to the Gentiles in Joppa. Then Peter began to speak to them. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message, 
spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, and after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went from doing good and healing all of those who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to all people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. From the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. I remember when I first saw the movie Gone with the Wind. And I must have been about 13 or 14, the stage in a girl's life, or at least in mine, when romance is a big priority, for me, found in books and movies. And Gone with the Wind has it all. I remember being at school and talking with my friends about it. Remember the part about, and oh, remember when that happened? I loved it. But I cried desperately at the end. Surely that can't be it. Surely that can't be the end. After all they'd been through, Rhett Butler just goes off into the fog and Scarlet, weeping piteously in the doorway, she'll, that she'll get him back somehow. But she'll think about it, of course, tomorrow, because tomorrow is another day. Rhett, you go. Where shall I go? What shall I do? Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. <laughs> I can't let him go. I can't. There must be some way to bring him back. Oh, I can't think about it now. I go crazy if I do. I, I'll think about it tomorrow. I love the movie but hated the ending. It just didn't seem like an ending. It left me disappointed and worried and unresolved. Very, very unsatisfying. And there are apparently a lot of people who feel the same way about Gone with the Wind. There are all kinds of YouTube videos and scripts and a novel or two. 
that attempt to bring that hanging ending of Gone with the Wind to a more satisfying conclusion. There have been lots of books and movies that many people feel don't have endings that match the quality of the rest of the work. And one of them is the Gospel of Mark. For those of you who read along in your Bibles when Doris, with Doris as she read from the Gospel of Mark, I wonder if you notice something a little peculiar about what comes after the passage she read. Sections of the text labeled shorter ending in Mark, longer ending in Mark, and then a thick paragraph in italics that refers to what other ancient authorities add. All of those italics and extra labels represent centuries of scholarly study and centuries of confusion and disappointment. Disappointment because Mark finished his gospel at verse 8, where Doris stopped reading. You may well imagine why this stopping place caused problems. The women, they saw what they saw at the tomb, no body of Jesus, an angel who spoke to them, and an instruction to head to Galilee. But, Mark tells us, they were so shocked and afraid, they ran away and didn't say a word to anyone. And that's the end. They said, they said nothing. No resurrection appearances of Jesus. Both of the other alternate endings of the Gospel, the shorter and the longer, are very early additions to the Gospel, between maybe 100 and 200 years after Jesus' death. But it's, a well, it's well established by scholars that these additional endings were indeed written later and not by Mark. But who could blame those copyists and translators for thinking you know, they've lost the last page and needed to fix the ending. What about the other disciples? How'd they find out if the women told them nothing? What about the going and telling the good news? How did anyone find out if those women were too afraid to tell? Of course, the obvious answer is that they did indeed tell. Otherwise, we wouldn't know anything about it. But I want to think now a little about what it means to have Mark's gospel end where it does. What could Mark have been thinking? Well, now I'm going to tell you a little about the actual text of the Bible, how we've come to have these particular words in the Bible today. First of all, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scripture, is is one long text, one version of the whole Hebrew scriptures called, and it's called the Masoretic text. It's been copied and handed down and copied again and again. And here and there, there's evidence of perhaps a, a word left out by a scribe who was maybe getting sleepy, or a case of looking at the line above and writing down the wrong word. But overall, it is one long text all from the same source. And a group of Jewish scholars called the Masoretes, who lived in the ninth century in Israel, carefully preserved a much earlier text and, and regularized it, and it has been the same ever since. The New Testament text, however, is a whole different story. It is not one continuous writing from one source, but a conglomeration of a whole lot of sources that scholars have over the centuries pretty much agreed on. So maybe from one old scroll found in North Africa, um, dating from maybe the third century, we have, say, a couple of Paul's letters. From another scroll found in Jerusalem, there's 
one of the se one of the same letters of Paul and maybe half the book of the book, uh, book of Revelation. Different texts of the Gospels in other places, carefully copied, treasured, and handed down. But when they say those two Pauline letters are compared, but say when, when these two Pauline letters are compared, there are sometimes little differences. Which is the older? Which is the more correct one? Which is the one that Paul really wrote? Are the differences simple copying errors? Or are they more significant? Which are the interpretations the first writers put in there? And which are subsequent interpolations? Multiply these questions and many more by the approximately 5,000 whole or partial early manuscripts of the New Testament. And you have a lot of sorting out to do. Fortunately, biblical scholars over many centuries, starting from shortly after the time of Jesus himself, scholars have been doing that sorting. And most of the time, it's pretty clear which is the most original version, usually because it can be established that it's the oldest. So in the end, we have a New Testament that is indeed the Word of God, that's been cared for, copied, loved, and handed down, but which in a way came through faithful Christians in places all over the Middle East and North Africa. The oldest manuscripts of the Gospel of Mark end at chapter 16, verse 8, where Doris ended. Among the later manuscripts, one has the shorter ending, as described in your Bible, and several have the longer ending, and some have both, and some have even more additions. But you have to sympathize with wanting to put another ending there. If you were writing a biography of Jesus, would you end it with the three women having this absolutely stunning experience of finding the tomb empty of Jesus' body and then just running away because they were afraid? Would you point out that despite being told by no less than an angel that Jesus had risen from the dead and that they should pass this news on to the other disciples, the women said and did Nothing. Wouldn't you try to end the book on a more, I don't know, upbeat note, even a triumphant one? Because as it is, it sure seems peculiar to leave out the rest of the story that Matthew and Luke and John give us. Now, because those other Gospels tell pretty much the same story that those other endings in Mark tell, the additional ones, we don't have to doubt their truth, just the authorship. What could Mark have been thinking by ending his gospel where he did? Was he interrupted? Was the page lost? What was he thinking? Well, first his ending reflects the fact that it takes a considerable adjustment in one's thinking to accept the concept of someone who was dead coming alive again. Back in December the year 2000 there was a Reuters report of a man in Kazakhstan who was accidentally electrocuted. And as according to Muslim tradition the man was wrapped in a cloth shroud and buried in a shallow grave after apparently dying while trying to steal power cables. Two days later, however, he regained consciousness, fought his way out of the shroud, and out from under the dirt. And there he was, stark naked, on the side of the road, trying to flag down a ride home. Now, I'm not saying that this is similar to the situation with Jesus. That man in Kazakhstan was, that was a case of resuscitation, not resurrection. 
But the astonishment of all reflects this inability to readjust our thinking, that he who was thought to be dead isn't. We just don't expect those who are dead to be up and walking around. Fear is an absolutely entirely appropriate and reasonable reaction for those women. It requires considerable reframing of one's understanding of reality to come to terms with the idea of resurrection. And it's quite understandable that one might want to keep such information to oneself, simply to avoid being thought of as, well, loony. Of course those women were terrified. They came to the tomb planning to finish the burial, actually to pour perfume and aromatic oils on the body. They were thinking about how to get the stone rolled away, not about whether Jesus' body would be there or not. They were also heart sick. Jesus' death was the, was the saddest thing in their lives. But it was something they knew about. Death, they knew, is part of life, and they were working at adjusting to Jesus being gone, and with him, their hopes. Resurrection was something entirely out of the realm of their experience. And faced with it there at the empty tomb, it scared the wits out of them. So we can understand Mark's ending from a psychological and an emotional perspective. The women were afraid. Of course they were. But this abrupt ending serves another marvelous purpose. Mark was no dabbler as a writer. He knew what he was doing. And this seemingly cut-off ending serves as a wonderful way to pull us, his readers, into the story and into faith. Think about it. Mark assumes that his readers are faithful followers of the risen Christ. He knows we know the story already. He knows we know about the resurrection appearances of Jesus, that he continues to be alive in the lives of his believers. Mark knows that we, his readers, have traveled the journey with Jesus, from baptism by John, to his teaching, to healing, through Galilee, to Jerusalem, to trial and crucifixion. By virtue of the fact that we're reading Mark's gospel, Mark knows that we already understand things that the disciples in the story do not yet know. Remember how Mark keeps mentioning how dense the disciples were. They don't understand. But he knows that we do know because we already know the story. We already know about the days of Holy Week, the, the last week of Jesus' earthly life. After all, that's what we just, we just did at our Monday Thursday service, in our vigil on Good Friday, and the Good Friday Tenebrae service. We sat in our pews or in front of a screen and read and listened and thought and prayed and sang. By staying with the story, Mark's readers remain faithful the end. We are awake in the Garden of Gethsemane when the disciples are falling asleep. And we know before the women get there that the tomb will be empty. What we do not expect is the women's fear-filled flight in silence. The story, the way Mark tells it, is left with no one to proclaim the good news. No one to tell, no one to proclaim, he's risen, he's risen indeed. And of course, this is where we faithful readers come in. We have stuck with Jesus all the way along, and now we're faced with a decision. Are we going to run in silence like the women? Or are we going to boldly proclaim the good news that Jesus is risen? The abrupt ending of Mark's Gospel gives us the chance to decide 
how the story will come out for, for ourselves. We could say that the idea of a resurrected Jesus, a risen living Lord, is just too weird to get our minds around. We could say that it's a lovely story, but it has nothing really to do with us. Or we could begin our part of the story with he is risen and alive in my life and will be in yours as well. Mark leaves Easter a little unfinished, so there's room for us in the story. He leaves a spot for us to, to fit in and then move forward from there, to not only witness to the new life that Jesus had and has, but to know that new life for ourselves. It's only fitting that just as the tomb will not contain Jesus, neither can Mark's story. Jesus is not bound by its ending. He continues into the future, the future God has in store for all of us. It is this day of resurrection when we rediscover that this world is not only the place where Jesus died, it's also where he lives. Because he is alive, we are free to live as well. Even though tears may be flowing as we see the problems of this world, we can still follow Christ. We can feed those who are hungry. We can speak truth to power. We can share what we have. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let us pray. Gracious God, teach us to walk by faith. Remind us that we follow you in faith and not by sight. May we with great hope and all trust stand there at the entrance to your empty tomb and be and do what you would have us be and do. Help us believe and to go and tell. In the name of our risen Lord we pray. Amen. I invite you to join me in the affirmation of faith. This is the good news which we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, and that he appeared first to the woman, then to Peter, and then to the twelve, and then to the many faithful witnesses. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is our Lord and our God. Amen.
Let us pray. Gracious, everlasting God, we give you our thanks and praise that Christ is risen indeed. The very earth celebrates your triumph as fresh green and pink life burst forth from beneath the cold earth. We, like the first green blades of spring, reach toward the radiance of the risen sun. Because he is risen, sin and death have no power to hold us in the grave. We are an Easter people, blessed by your miracle of life after death. All our hope and trust is in your grace. Teach us to rise to the challenges of our daily lives with the energy of people who've been given a new chance at life, a fresh start with all good things now possible. Awaken us to the delights we overlook in our routine haste and worry. Show us beauty in ordinary places. Show us mirth in the midst of serious business. Show us energy for change in the course of our regular ruts. Show us the solid ground in the midst of a quaking and breaking, unstable world. Help us to leave behind, like empty grave clothes, all the cowering and craving and crass manipulation in which the world has schooled us so well. Help us to step forth, full of courage, into a new day, a new season of growth and grace, a time of victory over, over every temptation and torment from evil, whose power over us is ending. Give courage to those who are looking for work. Help them to have confidence in your care and hope for the future. Be with all parents and children, especially parents and their teenagers. Help them to both look up and beyond the immediate difficulties futures in which healing has happened and love has returned. Be with those who are ill. May their bodies and minds and hearts know your healing touch. May the new life of this Easter season enliven their souls. Give hope to those without food, without shelter, without the basic things that make all human beings feel cared for able to look to you for comfort. We pray for peace, that our world's longed for peace would come, that your promise of sword beaten into plowshares and tanks into tractors might be fulfilled. We pray in the name of our risen Lord, Jesus the Christ. Amen. That Easter day with joy was bright, the sun shone out with fairer light, when to their longing eyes restored, the apostles saw their risen Lord. O Jesus, King of gentleness, do all our immers of our grateful praise. From every weep on death can wield your own redeemed forever shield. O Lord of all, with us abide in this our joyful Easter time. Go out into the world in peace, rejoicing that Christ is risen indeed. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen.